King 5 broke the story today that two more Hanford workers got sick this afternoon from unknown chemical vapors at Hanford, bringing the total to 36 people now since mid-March. Those uh, toxic vapor events prompted King 5 investigator Susanna Frame to report on the human toll of Hanford's dirty secrets. And tonight, in her latest story, she reveals a pattern of delays and denials for workers who get sick and apply for a program set up just for them by the Department of Labor. How many of you believe that you or your loved one got sick from working at Hanford? I did. I did. I did. All these people belong to a club they never wanted to join. They've either lost a loved one or are extremely sick after working at Hanford. Exposed to toxic chemicals, heavy metals and solvents at the most contaminated work site in America. When you've gotten sick, how many of you feel like the government kind of turned its back on you? I do. Roger Ibarra and Dick Simonis on the right both have a degenerative lung disease that causes emphysema called COPD. Ron Stevens has that and more. I've got uh, kidney failure. I've got uh, cancer. I'm in remission for stage four throat cancer and uh, COPD. Scott Passage's COPD is so advanced he's coping with just 28% lung capacity. Uh, I'm supposed to be on oxygen 24-7. Dale Gear worked in the Hanford tank farms for 26 years where he says the safety teams told him he was protected from metals like mercury and lead. Now he's sick with COPD and brain damage. How'd you like to breathe that crap in as safety says everything's okay? I lost my stomach about a year and a half ago to cancer. At 49, Terry Wattenberger is constantly in and out of the hospital with COPD, two types of cancer and a muscle disease. Two years ago, he appeared healthy with a full line in front of him. Since then, he's lost 70 pounds and is struggling to hang on. So you feel like working there is going to end your life? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah. Being sick isn't the only thing this group has in common. Each one has applied for financial help through a U.S. Department of Labor program. It was set up 15 years ago specifically for sick workers who did the secret and dangerous nuclear defense work for the country throughout the Cold War and the ongoing cleanup. But after applying, they all found themselves fighting. And I fought and I fought and I fought them. And, I, and I, I, it's a losing battle. The Department of Labor accepts that the workers in our group interview were exposed to toxins like arsenic, ammonia, asbestos, and cadmium, a metal with radioactive isotopes. But doctors hired by Department of Labor contractors found working at Hanford was not a significant factor in causing, contributing to, or even aggravating their illnesses. How many of you have been denied once by the Department of Labor? I have. I have. Twice? I have. I have. Three times? I have. This report, commissioned by Congress in 2010, lays out some of the problems with the program. Investigators found there's no oversight of the consultant physicians who have recommended the denials. These are doctors hired by Department of Labor paid contractors to review medical files. They never actually see the patients. The department declined to be interviewed on camera, but sent a statement to say consulting doctors are used not to hurt, but actually to help claimants who may not be able to meet their burden of proof. That's not the way these people see it. I just think that we're all getting a raw deal. And uh, I don't know why, but they, they take the, the uh, they, they follow uh, somebody that really don't know me, that don't know any of us, and is going to stamp or reject on, on your form. The congressional investigation also found processing claims can take between a few months to more than seven years. Seven years. Many sick workers don't have that long as the medical bills pile up. I mean, they're running and hiding and denying and denying and denying. And they don't care and all this money's come out of my pocket. I mean, that's what's irritating me bad. I could die in six months. My lungs are going that fast. And uh, I worry about my wife. That's all. Because you want her to be taken care of. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We got bills coming in right now. These workers and survivors of lost loved ones say the system is so cumbersome, so lacking in compassion, that they believe the government is simply waiting them out to save money. How many of you feel as though the government is waiting for you to die? Absolutely. They can outweigh, outlast, and outspend 
any of the workers that I've seen. Dr. Brian Campbell is a neuropsychologist in Spokane who's evaluated dozens of Hanford workers. It's very difficult, in my opinion, for the worker to, um, to pass that denial threshold. Of Dr. Campbell's patients, the case of Dale Gear is perhaps the best example of that. Remember, he has lung disease and brain damage. It took Gear five years to get the Department of Labor to help him with his COPD. Now he has an in-home nurse once a week to manage that lung disease, along with boxes of drugs and nebulizer treatments. I'm sick every day. I hurt from the time I get up until the time I go to bed. Doctors across the country have found working at Hanford most likely caused Gear's illnesses, including his brain damage. One went so far as to say there is no other plausible explanation for the heavy metals in his system, toxins that cause dementia. And after this letter was written? He was denied. What more does a person need to do than clearly state that the workers' exposure at Hanford led to the problems described. The group tells us no one's looking to get rich. They want their medical needs taken care of. And for those already gone, their survivors want to pay the bills left behind. What they thought the U.S. government agreed to when they went to work at Hanford. They promised if we did get sick, they'd take care of us. And now they kind of just, okay, you know, you don't count now because you're, you're, you're out of the mix. You're, you're not labor no more, you're not in the union, you're on your own, and uh, this ain't right. In Pasco, Susanna Frame, King 5 News. This ain't right. The Department of Labor tells King 5 they've approved about half of the claims submitted by Hanford workers since the beginning of the program. That translates into roughly $1 billion in compensation paid to 10,000 claimants. And, of course, the same thing goes with our policy toward dealing with nuclear seismic testing, which shows most of our nuclear reactors can't withstand an earthquake, which we're going to talk about in a minute with Chris Harris, with Fukushima and with WIP reactors in Carlsbad, New Mexico, where we now have a report that Chris sent me. Now, Chris, I'd like rather than seal your thunder, I want you to re read it. Uh, we talked about it briefly earlier, about the WIP reactor nuclear site in plutonium-239 actually causing a nuclear explosion. And, of course, the anonymous employee saying they put us in danger. Tell us about the WIP reactor and what's going on there. Hello, Dr. Bill. Well, in the WIP reactor, now, now remember, this, this, re, this uh, report, there was a potential for the plutonium flash, which is a criticality event. Uh, I, right. I don't, I, I'm, like I said, I haven't done the analysis on that myself. So but let's just go uh, talk about what is. What is is that, the Department of Energy had a decision to cut back on the uh, the uh, waste isolation pilot plant's safety requirements to save some money. And in that, they have also decided to make some changes to the packing material that's used in these uh, highly radioactive waste drums, which, which contain plutonium salts. And... Uh, they used an organic material instead of a non or instead of a non organic material, and uh, I, in fact, I, I was just talking it over today with uh, one of my colleagues, who is uh, very esteemed uh, in in waste handling and waste processing. You know, we'll call him Barney for now, but he uh, basically says, "Is that what they did? They put uh, organic material, and that's a hydrogen explosion, and." Yeah. Um, so, you know, in the, in the present, but a hydrogen explosion can trigger criticality. Well, most people don't realize the Tritron switches that cause that use a C4 a plastic, which is what they used to try to detonate the nuclear weapons back at, in the 1930s and 40s. They were actually using Tritron high speed fast switches so they could simultaneously detonate and compress the ball of plutonium to create a nuclear explosion or criticality. When you have a hydrogen explosion, you can likewise create criticality. And what it does is it temporarily increases the neutron flux that causes a chain reaction, and that causes an explosion. So that's how it can happen. Hydrogen triggered plutonium-239 nuclear explosions can be triggered by hydrogen, right? That's right. Yeah, it all would depend you know, whether they're going to achieve a critical mass or not, and there's like different categories of the criticality. Yeah, but it may only be partial. Maybe it's not, right. you know, it's not clean, so it's only like 2% of the total mass of plutonium. 
but enough flux occurs, you get what's called neutron flux, and then of course it blows up the bomb and disperses all the isotopes all over Hell's Half Acre. So this is what happened with these kitty litter, these green kitty litter from the Department of Energy and the Obama administration. They went green all right, but the green unfortunately was like the, you know, the uh, the goblin from you know Spider-Man. Yeah. Uh, the right. green was nuclear. It was bad idea. It was turning these things literally into cooking bombs. Crazy. It, it, yeah, and it didn't have to happen this way. It, right. Big, what, what I'm also finding is that. Uh, what part of the cutbacks? Well, they lost the, they lost track of, of specific drums and their locations in in, in big vaults known as panels. Right. And so you really don't know where all this material is. That well, they didn't properly log it. it. In other words, they they didn't log right. the material properly to be able to track it to which ones they modified with the new green kitty litter, did it? No, I, I was. You know what? I was thinking. Well, you know, they have they have impeccable records. And it yeah, would be easy yeah. to do. you're hoping. Yeah. You're hoping. Well, I, hoping. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I just know the way the way that we do things, and you know, yeah, that, that well, it should be, be done. It makes sense. It should be done right. And yeah. uh, I guess I was wrong. That it's, it's done. Yeah. In a well, more you, you, you guys are impeccable because you're the safety guys who come in to clean up the mess or do a, a proper evaluation. So, that's the next question. <clears throat> The seismic testing here in America with the NRC started by Jasco before he was replaced because he was opening too many cans of worms. What's happening there? Uh, they finished their evaluation of all these nuclear plants and said, guess what, they all fail or we're going to study a lot more. What, what's the outcome? What's going on with all these nuclear plants? Several have failed outright where there's going to be modifications have to be made. i got to go ahead and, and write you a synopsis of those so you right. have an idea. Um, others are... Uh, can be wished away, provided that there's enough analysis. Wished away is, a, is I guess that's a term we use, where right. you talk about sharpening the pencils and all that. However, uh, it's still that that's a lot of work in itself to to sell that. You know, you have to actually sell to sell it that uh, that you are safe because you you know you have this much margin of safety in the in the uh, in the build of your plant. Well, you know, that's... Well, you need, uh, they should have data, though. I mentioned before they should yep. have uh, soil quality data, data on the structural integrity of welds, uh, crystal data with uh, basically x-ray and ultrasound of all the joints and welds and rivets. Uh, they should know the structural integrity of pipes that may be thinned out. They did A couple of years ago, they were actually trying to use a brush to clean out pipes in a nuclear reactor near Chicago. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the plant. I think we talked about this, and yep. the actual brush went through the pipe. It's like, well, the brush should not go through the pipe. Newly revealed documents show radioactive waste may have contaminated areas outside the Westlake landfill in Bridgeton. Our Grant Bissell has been poring over these documents all day long. He joins us now with what all this means, Grant. Yeah, Kay, let's be very clear. First off, experts tell me these findings do not pose an immediate risk to human health but community members say they do raise a lot of questions. Take a look at this map. The two yellow dots you see represent soil samples taken along St. Charles Rock Road just outside the Westlake landfill. The tests were done in 2005 by the Missouri Department of Natural Resources. One sample found radiation almost six times higher than background or naturally occurring levels. The other sample was more than three and a half times higher. Well, the Army Corps of Engineers tells me the levels would have to be even higher for them to come in and clean up the site. The problem community members has is what they call misleading public statements like this being made by the EPA. And the NRD had a number of soil samples along Bunker Road and Towsing Road in 2005 or something like that. Um, and they did not find anything in those samples. Anything about remediation? Anything about background is the best of my knowledge. Community members say the test results show radiation levels along the rock road are clearly higher than they should be. But the question remains, how did the radioactive material get there in the first place? Mike? Grant. Oh yeah, go on, click the subscribe button. Uh, we need to get subscribed and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the remix button, hit the remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad. Cell filled 
England. Now, one of the stores was the most toxic pond in Europe. This is very misleading. There's 8 million liters a day pouring into that ocean. 8 million liters a day. And what that does is it gets out into the currents and it travels and radiates everything. It's so toxic that they have to shoot seagulls if they land there because they become radioactive. It's so toxic that the wind blowing over it becomes contaminated. It's so toxic because you can never ever stop this. You can never turn this off. It's going to take approximately 20 years at 80 transport trucks a day to clean that site up. Now I want you to keep into consideration the word ocean and water through all of this video. 8 million liters a day going into the ocean. You want to burn down your home if you don't recycle your tin cans. The Italian Mafia has been using the sea as a convenient location to dump over 40 ships that were loaded with toxic and radioactive waste into the Mediterranean waters since 1994. This is where all the tourists are hanging out. Think about the fishing industry, how popular that is in Italy, and how the people are being poisoned by the isotopes that are leaking out of these drums that will rust out in a matter of a couple of years. You won't see the environmentalists going after a mob in Italy for sinking 40 ships in the Mediterranean Sea, but they sure as hell want to stick you in a mental institution and drug you up if you don't recycle your cardboard. These creatures are not just constrained to Italy. During a 2004 tsunami, over 600 barrels of toxic nuclear waste had washed up on the Somalian coastline. These barrels dated back to the 1990s. And that's the reason why we see Somalia has turned into a wasteland. More here an environmentalist calling out the Italian Mafia when 600 barrels of nuclear waste washed up on the Somalian coastline. Oh no, but they want to murder you, they want to kill you. You don't recycle your pop bottles. 17,000 containers of radioactive waste. It's just part of the catalog of waste dumped at the sea by the Soviets that we know about. There was 19 ships that are containing radioactive waste were sunk. There was 14 nuclear reactors sunk, including five that still contained spent nuclear fuel. There was 735 other pieces of radioactively contaminated heavy machinery. This could be everything from front end loaders, the bulldozers that was burying the contaminants. And there was a K-27 nuclear submarine with two reactors that are still loaded with nuclear fuel. Dumped into the Kara Sea, right by the Arctic Ocean. The environmentalists calling out the Soviets for 17,000 containers of radioactive waste or 19 ships containing radioactive waste or 14 nuclear reactors with nuclear fuel. No, but I see them want to genetically alter your children. I see them want to blow your children up. Philip and Tracy. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. Your own choice. Okay, class, thank you so much for today, and I will see you all tomorrow. Oh, just before you go, I just need to press this little button here. Now, everybody, please remember to read chapters 5 and 6 on volcanoes and glaciation. Except for Philip and Tracy, of course. But don't stop there. Off the coastline of California, 30 kilometers from San Francisco, a huge, massive city, your loving government dumped 47,500 barrels containing plutonium, cesium, strontium, the most toxic stuff on the planet. That's 2.5 million gallons or 80 million Dixie cups of the most toxic stuff on this planet. This is your government done this to you. This is the people that say they're going to protect you. This is the people that scream about someone might set off a dirty bomb. Dirty bomb. This is what they scream about all the time. One can imagine an enormous amount of disruption, even if a very small uh, dirty bomb were detonated. 
to counter the danger, an unprecedented effort to equip first responders with radiation detectors. From the city to the suburbs, remember. You want to hear an environmentalist calling out their own government when 47,000 barrels are dumped 30 miles off the coast of San Francisco. But they want to have war crimes tribunal for you if you don't recycle your plastic. There's 90,000 bunker ships on the ocean at any given time. 16 of those produce more pollution than all the automobiles on this planet. Of the 7 billion people on this planet, those 16 ships produce more pollution. With 90,000 ships out there, you're looking at 5,625 civilizations on planet Earth every day. The equivalent of 40,000 billion people worth of pollution every day. 40,000 billion people on Earth every day. The animosity equivalent in automotive. Because of those 90,000 bunker ships and the stuff they're burning, you can't, it's supposed to be going to a toxic waste site. It can't be refined anymore. But for some reason, they allow these 90,000 ships out there, these big, massive ships, to burn this toxic waste. That's your acidification of your oceans. That's the pollution you're seeing in your atmosphere. The implications, all these particles, the, these are nuclei for clouds. There's 3,000 more of these great big ships on the books to be made over the next three years. I hear environmentalists, UT professors calling for the murder of 90% of the people on this planet, yet 16 container ships produce more pollution than all the automobiles on this planet combined. And there's 90,000 of those ships out there. I hear the environmentalists demonize us for the size of our footprint. They demonize for the bottles and our cans and our plastics. But they don't go after the 65,000 chemicals that are unregulated. They don't have no environmental or human impact studies on it. That's causing all of these issues. That's the tragedy. And uh, that law basically grandfathered onto the market uh, all the chemicals that were already on the market as of 1981. Which means 65,000 chemicals have never ever been assessed for their toxicity or their effect on the environment or human health. I see the same people that are crying for all the insects and the animals all over the planet calling for your death and then also calling for diplomatic immunity. You don't see them calling for justice and what happened in Vietnam. They came trailed that sky with Agent Orange for nine years. They killed every insect, every animal, every plant on that goddamn continent. By U.S. forces to destroy the jungle hideouts of enemy communist forces. The springs went on for nine years. American soldiers came home suffering the effects of Agent Orange. And then there is Japan. Built on a perpetual earthquake fault line is only a matter of time before the big one. When it finally came, the nuclear alarm was worst nightmares become surreal. It's a massive destruction unlike anything witnessed by a living human a tsunami flows over Fukushima's prefecture. Bringing with it a misery that will outlast any human that can survive it. Over 20,000 have died, the most traumatic death imaginable. News breaks shortly after Fukushima Daiichi's nuclear power plant has reported a power out and failure of backup generators. These are the life-sustaining reactor cooling pumps. Three nuclear reactors are out of control and without cooling soon the word comes of explosion or radioactive emergency. The world gets its first picture of explosions, and then Japan throws everything it has at it. Helicopters are put into action to dose the area with water in a desperate attempt to cool the estimated 600,000 of the most dangerous volatile nuclear waste rods on Earth. Explosions have flung them for miles. These rods were kept above the reactors in pools of heavy water 30 feet deep to cool and contain them, but a hydrogen explosion has removed those safeguards in a moment. 4,277 tons of nuclear waste on that site, the equivalent of 200,000 Nagasaki bombs. The reactor 3 has 6% of MOX fuel in it. That is 2 million times more dangerous than nuclear rods. And it's not just Fukushima's thousand mile, what I call an iceberg. 
it's all these toxins from all these sites and all these oceans and all these rivers that are coming out and are irradiating all the marine life on the floor. They're irradiating the kelp. It's irradiating all the birds all along that coastline. They're eating stuff that's irradiated from this from this huge massive plume. Think of it as an iceberg that's a thousand miles rubbing along the coastline radiating all the fish and radiating the salmon and the and the tuna and the herring and the mackerel and the squid and think of these big plumes on the planet just like an icebergs think of it as a thousand miles of ice coming along your coastline and radiating your sea lions and your seals and your dolphins and your whales and your ear and your coastline itself and it's all done by just a handful of people not the entire planet. This was done by a handful of people, but we're demonizing every human on this planet rather than going after the real issue. And it's going to keep happening until we actually point fingers. Think of each one of these bullets as dirty bombs. Every one of these things are dirty bombs. Your loved ones are going over to foreign countries and whacking that country with dirty bombs. Millions and millions and millions of dirty bombs. And they're coming home and having deformed kids because they were so close to those dirty bombs. Think of Hanford. Billions of gallons dumped on the ground. I know this sounds incredible to people, but there are 40 miles of unlined trenches at Hanford, if you stretch them end to end, into which our federal government, your government, was dumping radioactive waste from nuclear weapons production and its own reactors even though it seeps right out of those trenches. And, and that stuff is all moving through the soil to the Columbia River. They're, what they're not telling the public is that they also deliberately dumped out of the high-level nuclear waste tanks in the 1950s and 1960s billions of gallons of liquids into the soil. Think of this stuff so toxic that a Dixie cup will kill everybody in a restaurant for an hour, every hour, for a billion years. This is probably the most dangerous stuff on the planet ever. Uh, very, very small quantities of this waste. Um, and it's been said that a Dixie cup full of this waste in a crowded restaurant, everyone would be dead in the restaurant inside of an hour. If, even the amount that would fit on the leg of a fruit fly uh, is considered a problem dose, and that's happened at Hanford. Fruit flies have landed on contaminated materials and then flown off to go to the lunchroom and deposit contamination on food and on tables and whatnot, and they've had to evacuate a 20-acre area at the Hanford site because of uh, hot fruit flies and wasps. So this, this waste in these tanks is very dangerous in small quantities, and it has another feature, which is it's dangerous for very, very long periods of time. And is, is demonizing everybody over cardboard and tin cans and plastic the right thing to do? Or is it to go after this real issue? Instead of spending $2 billion a day on the military industrial machine, spend $2 billion a day on cleaning this up and it'll all be gone in no time. It could be all gone in no time. It's that simple. We just can't get ourselves out of this rah, rah, rah nationalism where you just got to go along to get along. And if environmentalists think stopping tin cans and pop bottles and fucking plastic is going to save the planet, they're so fucking lost in the game. They're so lost. We haven't got a hope in hell. We have to have this message out there somehow. Somebody has to do this. And I don't know who that is.